Okay, welcome to Rep Lecture 9, I think the number is. So this will be on orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, also known as OFDM. So, oh, there it goes. I don't know if you see that second cursor. Hold on, let me fix this. Okay, now we're good. Um, <clears throat> So what are we gonna to do today? So first we have OFDM motivations, like always. Why do we actually wanna use it? Um, and there's gonna be a lot of background information there. Then we have frequency division multiplexing, which is kind of a general version of which OFDM is a subset of. Then of course, next we have turning OFD, uh, FDM into OFDM. FDM being frequency division multiplexing. And then we have, we have to talk about how we actually use OFDM in a communication system. How do we modulate or demodulate? And after that, we'll talk a little bit about some other OFDM uses. So on the motivation side, why do we want to use it? So if we want to transmit at a high data rate, we naturally need two things. One is uh, either a high symbol rate. So how many symbols are we sending per second? More symbols per second means more data we can send. And the other one is how many symbol, sorry, how many bits can we fit in per symbol? So remember each modulation has a certain order. So BPSK, for example, is an order two modulation, meaning we can fit in log base two of two bits per symbol. Four quam is four. There's four, sim four quam symbols. So you can fit log base two of four, which equals two bits per symbol, right? And so, you know, we can go to arbitrary numbers like 64 quam, 128 quam, and just shove more and more bits into each symbol. But at a certain point, uh, you can't do that anymore. And the reason is the higher the modulation order, the more susceptible you are to noise and interference. And so at some point you just get too many bit errors that you can't keep increasing the modulation order. So clearly the only other thing you can do is increase the symbol rate. Now, the, there's also a clear problem with increasing symbol rate, right? So if I clone my symbol rate R, I, um, the symbol rate is roughly, uh, well, it's roughly equal to, but proportional to the bandwidth of the modulation, right? So if my symbol rate is 20,000 symbols per second, my bandwidth is roughly 20 kilohertz. Um, and if you wanna be precise, if we're using say a, a raised cosine uh, filter on our symbols, then the bandwidth is one plus beta, where beta is the roll-off factor over T. Right, but T is the symbol period. So if beta is zero, then R is equal to B. If beta is one, then R is equal to two B and so on. So, <clears throat> So clearly, if we keep increasing symbol rate, then we have to increase the bandwidth of our modulation. And we, there's only so much bandwidth we can work with, right? Because we're allocated a certain amount of bandwidth and we can't go above that. So anyway, um, there's, so that, that, that's the, um, the true limitation of how much data we can send, right? The bandwidth, but there's also limitations due to, you know, uh, the, the channel itself, the electronics you're using in your transmitter and receiver. And we'll, we'll take a look at specifically the channel and see how that plays into uh, the, our bandwidth limitation. So um, up till now, we've basically been considering narrow band communications, meaning that the bandwidth is fairly small and as such, we can assume that the transfer function of the channel, you know, the wireless channel is effectively constant over that entire bandwidth. 
right? So if the bandwidth, sorry, if the channel frequency response, you know, some ripply thing, we're saying that our bandwidth is so small, you know, let's say it's this little sliver here, that this part of the channel transfer function is effectively flat and we can ignore any frequency deviations across that small bandwidth. And that means that there's effectively no distortion of our signal as it travels through the channel. But like I said, as you keep increasing the symbol rate, the bandwidth needs to increase. And wide bandwidths mean trouble, dot, 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 very ominous. Okay, so let's see what the trouble is. Or this is one of the troubles. There's many other troubles, but this one is kind of fundamental. So if you consider just a generic transmitter and receiver, you know, here's your, your transmitter antenna on the left over here. And here's the receiver antenna. <clears throat> and the transmitter is sending some signal to the receiver. And assuming there's that these antennas are in free space, there's no other objects around, then there's gonna be, the, the signal is gonna to travel to the receiver in one single path, because there's nothing for that signal to reflect on or anything. It's gonna be what's called a line of sight communication. Um, if, if these antennas can't see each other, then clearly they can't communicate. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, and that's all fine and dandy, but <clears throat> what if there is in fact an obstacle? You know, here there's a plane, but it doesn't have to be a plane. It could be a building, it could be the ground. Um, there's many things that signals can reflect on. Um, and it, it doesn't have to be purely metallic for it to reflect, but things that aren't metallic will add some attenuation uh, in addition to the attenuation you face just going through the air. Um, <clears throat> so essentially what's gonna happen is there's gonna be multiple paths from the transmitter to the receiver, right? You have the line of sight path, which is here, it's called the main path. And you have this secondary path that reflects off this plane and uh, finds its way to the receiver eventually. So there's two things that are gonna happen here. One is, um, you know, the line of sight path is the shortest path from the transmitter to the receiver. So it's probably going to experience the least amount of attenuation and the least amount of time delay as it travels from the transmitter to the receiver. And this pink second path that reflects off this plane has certainly a longer distance to travel from the transmitter to the receiver. It also has to undergo this reflection, which will add some attenuation. So there is the extra attenuation of the longer path and the reflection. Um, and there's also a longer time delay due to the longer path, right? So here's the scary math slide. So let's see how this adds up. So suppose we're sending just a, you know, just a sine wave uh, from the transmitter. And we want to see what happens at the receiver. What, it, what is the receiver receiving when we send this sine wave? So I'm going to assume that there are n paths that the signal is going to take from the transmitter to the receiver. Um, so the path of zero is the line of sight path, and all the other ones are just reflections off objects in the vicinity between the transmitter and receiver. So, like I said, two things are going to happen. There's going to be some attenuation of the signal. There's also going to be some time delay. And if you remember your uh, Fourier transforms, a time delay is effectively a, a linear phase shift in frequency. But we'll, we'll see that later. And so that this is a fairly simplified model of what's actually happening. Um, there are more complex models that will take into account uh, phase, uh, additional phase shifts that occur due to re the reflections off non-perfect electric conductors. Um, and there, there's some other effects. You know, you might, if you know your E&M stuff, there might be some polarization change and so on. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, 
if we only take into account attenuation and time delay, what the receiver is going to see is the sum of all of those n paths. So we have the summation here from zero to n minus one, so the n paths. And we have the original cosine two pi f, and we multiply it by an attenuation constant so that you know the alpha i's are all less than or equal to one. And there's also a time delay, the tau i. Um, and then we could simply you know, expand this uh, parenthesis here to just be two pi f t minus two pi f tau i. That's the only thing I did there. Now, uh, it, we can actually represent this in the form of an impulse response. So if you think of, you know, the cosine two pi f t is your original signal and you wanna create y of t using some convolution type thing. So how can we do that? Well, it's, it's fairly straightforward, right? We could just uh, have the alpha i times x of t, that's the attenuation. And then if we convolve it with a delta of t minus tau i, that just delays it by tau i, right? That's all, all this convolution is doing. And what I'll do is I'll write to the, we can pull the x of t out of the summation, right? So this goes over here. And then we're just left with the summations of the ai uh, times the delta t minus tau i, right? So I'm going to call that entire thing C of T. So that C of T will be the impulse response of the channel. And at the receiver, we just see the convolution of that impulse response with X of T. So far, so good. All right. And then I, I wrote out here exactly what C of T is. So th there's some interesting things we can see. So if you look at this impulse response, you basically just have a bunch of deltas that are scaled by the attenuation constant and are shifted in time by the delay. And you know, I, I plot an example of one particular channel impulse response down here. And you know, you have your you know, al alpha zero will be the attenuation of the line of sight path. So that, that'll likely be the highest uh, or the least amount of attenuation, right? So the closest to one. And it'll also be the first to arrive, right? Because it's the shortest path. So tau zero will essentially be the, the uh, distance between the transmitter and receiver divided by the speed of light. Or did I get that? Yeah, distance divided by speed of light. Okay. And at some point, these, these uh, at some point you'll stop receiving these uh, reflections, these additional reflections. And so eventually this impulse response will die down to zero. And we can call the total duration of the impulse response starting from this T zero all the way up to Tn minus one. I'm gonna call that this big Tm. Oops, I chopped off the end there. So Tn is called the multipath time um, or a multipath spread that's called multiple things. But here I'm just defining it as the, the, last, uh, uh, the last arrival time minus the first arrival time. And if you can kind of think about this intuitively, that if we're sending symbols through this channel, and the symbol period is much larger than this TM, this uh, multipath time or multipath spread, then effectively, effectively what's going to happen is all of these multipaths will arrive at the receiver long before the symbol is over. So in that case, we don't really need to care about this multi multipathing problem, right? So I'm saying if the symbol period is much longer than this multipath spread, there's no problem. And this is the situation we have in our case where we're sending things at very low data rates. And as a result, we don't have to worry about this problem. 
And so for rough orders of magnitude, TM might be on the order of like uh, microseconds or so sometimes it can get up to milliseconds, but that's uh, if you're working at pretty low frequencies. It tends to be the case that if you go higher in frequency, the uh, multipath time will decrease. And that's because as you go higher in frequency, you experience more attenuation. Uh, you know, when you reflect off things and when you're traveling through air. So uh, basically these impulses will be attenuated faster and so they'll go down to zero faster. So any questions so far? Yeah. Um, so we're receiving a whole bunch of different cosine waves in time, but it, it in the time domain, they're all... Um, they're all like happening simultaneously. The, the time shift is more a phase shift than it is an actual like. So I, I suppose my question is um, like, I don't see how a high symbol period means that we don't need to worry about it because like, won't you get interference between the different cosine waves that come in at the same time, irrespective of the symbol period? Right, so that, that's an interesting point you bring up. So um, think about it this way. Uh, say the, instead of uh, looking at the symbol period, say I look at the frequency of this cosine. So I can make the assumption that the the period of this cosine is much larger than the multipath time, the TM, right? And so if that, that means one over F is much smaller than one over TM, right? Yes. So, yeah. okay. So, uh, Right, so basically the first cosine that's going to come in is going to be a cosine of a 2 pi f t minus a 2 pi f t naught, right? And then the next cosine, that, or sorry, the last cosine that's going to come in, you know, there's alphas in front of these, but if I ignore the attenuation for now, there's going to be a 2 pi f t minus two pi f t naught plus tm. Right. So the question is, what is the additional phase shift between the first one and the last one? And if that phase shift approaches, say, pi, then these will add out of phase and they'll destructively interfere, and then you have problems. But but if you take a look at this, you're gonna have a, your two pi f t minus a two pi f t, a tau naught minus a two pi f t m. And the assumption I made is that a one over f is much, much larger than t m, which means f is much, much smaller than t m. So that means this two pi f t m is gonna be a small number. As come, Okay, I see. And so the, oh, and so the relative phase shift between the first and last signal you get is still not particularly significant. Exactly. Because they're both roughly two pi. Uh, okay, so the, oh, I okay, I see. Yep. And I think the next slide will add some more insight to this. Um, the, the other thing I'll point out is uh, this time delay it, it is indeed a phase shift, but the phase shift is different depending on the frequency, right? Because rem remember, if you look at the frequency domain, uh, a time delay in time will cause a phase shift in frequency. And this will become like a, a J two pi uh, F tau naught, or I'll call it tau I. So th this time delay will turn into a phase shift in frequency but this phase shift depends on frequency. Mm. And you notice that as frequency decreases, this phase shift becomes smaller. 
So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm saying for very low frequencies, we have no problem. Oh, okay. I see. Got it. Got it. And uh, one, one final question, um, just from a energy perspective, the sum of all alphas has to be less than equal to one, right? Uh, cur well, it, it kind of depends on how you define things. But so it, if you define the total energy transmitted by the transmitter as one, then yes, that's the case. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. So that's multipathing in the time domain. And it's also very instructive to look at what's happening in the frequency domain. I think this will clarify the point I made earlier as well. So, you know, from before we have, this is the impulse response of the channel, right? So you have their deltas that are shifted in time. You have the attenuation. So what is the frequency response? Well, that's that's pretty easy to find out. You just take the Fourier transform of this and you know you, you use your linear superposition, summations are linear operator. So you just get the alpha i's times a phase shift, like I said earlier. So you have minus j2 pi f tau i. Okay, so let, let's see the problems we can encounter here. So as you know, one of the most simple examples, I'm gonna say there are, there are exactly two paths that can be taken. Um, so n equals two. Here I'm saying alpha zero is equal to alpha i, which is equal to one. And this kind of goes against what I said earlier of the alpha i's have to add up to something less than one, but uh, the, the, the actual total is not important because it's just, uh, you just need to perform some normalization. It's not a critical thing. Um, then I'm saying the tau zero is equal to zero, which is unrealistic, but for the purposes of this, it, it, uh, it, uh, it's just to serve a point here. Tau I I'm saying is one microsecond. So the second path takes an additional microsecond from the first path to reach the receiver. So if we write out the frequency response, now we have a one, right? Because the first tau zero is zero. And then we have a e to the minus j two pi times 10 to the minus six times F. And 10 to the minus six is from one microsecond. So if you plot this, you get the thing on the right here. And you notice um, at certain frequencies, this goes all the way up to two. And so that means that there's gonna be an effective channel gain in a sense, right? Because all of these multi-paths are adding constructively. And uh, at other frequencies, you see that the frequency response goes all the way to zero, which means that these multi-paths are adding destructively. And that's no good because if you have zero gain in your, your, your channel, you're clearly not gonna be able to send any information from the transmitter to the receiver at that frequency. And so that this kind of effect where the frequency response of the channel will kind of dip sometimes uh, and cause additional, additional attenuation is called channel fading. And this multipathing is one potential cause of channel fading. It's not the only cause. Um, but it is a very you know, common and important cause. So if you look at this plot here and you kind of think about what is the effective bandwidth for like from here to here, uh, the, the effectively the peak point of here, it's roughly equal to one over TM. TM is the, again, the multipathing time, the multipath spread. And this is, makes intuitive sense, right? Because if the spread is longer, that means that there must be a shorter bandwidth. Or, or uh, this BC here, right? Because remember, if you have something that lasts for a long time in time, it must last for a very short time in frequency 
and vice versa. So if you have a very short multipath spread, you're gonna have a very large uh, BC. And BC, by the way, is called the coherence bandwidth. It, what, it, what it means is that it's the roughly the bandwidth uh, in, the, in the channel frequency response for which the uh, frequency response can be considered roughly constant. So we're saying if, um, sorry, this shouldn't say channel bandwidth. Um, I'm saying if, uh, you know, the transmission or the, I'll call it the modulation bandwidth, right? So basically the bandwidth of your modulation signal, if that is much smaller than this coherence bandwidth, we don't need to worry about fading. And you can clearly see, if I go back a slide, before we said TS, the symbol period is much larger than TM. Here I'm saying the modulation bandwidth B is much smaller than one over TM, right? But remember that B is roughly equal to one over TS, right? The symbol period. So these are consistent. They, may, they basically say the same thing. And if you look at this, right, because uh, remember TM here, I defined it as one microsecond minus zero. So it's one microsecond. One over one microsecond is uh, one megahertz, right? And if you look at the x-axis of uh, this plot here, it's, uh, it's in megahertz, right? 10 to the six. So if I look at one of these peaks and say my bandwidth is just this little sliver right here, that, that is pretty much much less, less than one megahertz. That's in line with this approximation here. So if my bandwidth is say, I don't know, you know 10 kilohertz or something, then we're, we're good to go. Um, however, if you end up in one of these, these fades, the channel fades, then you're, you're in trouble. So you gotta, you gotta be careful there. But uh, the, the bottom line though is that you clearly can't make the assumption that your channel will be constant across frequency if you're trying to transmit a wideband modulation. Okay. Um, here, here's a more uh, perhaps realistic example. So this is showing just uh, another frequency response of a channel. Here we're showing the coherence bandwidth. And again, you see that there are dips, uh, the, the channel, the fading, and sometimes you have little peaks that'll give you the most uh, or the least amount of attenuation at those particular frequencies. Okay, so uh, any questions about that? Okay, um, so that was motivation number one. It kind of took a while, but here's motivation number two. Um, so suppose we are a cellular base station, right? Uh, you know, T-Mobile, AT&T, whatever. And we have many different people, each of, the, each of these people has a cell phone. Um, and we wanna be able to communicate with each of those people at the same time. And there's many different ways to do this. The, this concept is called multiple access. So one method is you, basically allocate a certain period of time to certain users, and you'll transmit back and forth with those users at those specified times. And so that's called TDMA or time division multiple access. Uh, we can also allocate certain frequency bands to certain users. Uh, this is called frequency division multiple access, FDMA. Um, there's uh, signal processing techniques that you can, you, you can use. Um, some of them are called sp uh, spread spectrum techniques. Um, but what you essentially do is you allocate a certain code to each user. And that user can use that code to kind of decipher a jumble of messages together and pick out the one that's theirs. That's called CDMA or code division multiple access. Um, the last one I have listed here is using beam forming. This is used in 5G. Uh, uh, a millimeter wave communication. Um, and that's, that's a little more complex. The idea is that uh, 
you can essentially use a very narrow uh, beam antenna and direct that beam exactly to where that user is. So you can spatially differentiate between different users, hence the term spatial division multiple access or SDMA. Okay. So, and there's a few other techniques. Um, OFDM allows us to do what's called orthogonal frequency division multiple access, which is similar to this FDMA and we'll see exactly how, or sort of how it's implemented. And I think it'll become clear why it's useful. So to reiterate the goal here with OFDM is that we wanna transmit a large amount of information, right, a large number of bits per second uh, while avoiding distortion due to channel fading, right? So if we have a large bandwidth um, and we send that large bandwidth modulation through a channel, certain frequencies will be affected more than others. Some will be uh, like nulled out to zero and that's a huge problem. And it'll cause a lot of distortion to your uh, nice signal. Um, we may also wanna take advantage of this multiple axis concept. Uh, that's not always a requirement with systems, but uh, it is certainly a, requ a requirement in the cellular industry. Um, and while doing all of this, we also want to minimize the amount of bandwidth we use, uh, you know, the ratio between symbol rate and bandwidth, right? Uh, that's effectively the spectral efficiency, right? How much bandwidth we're using for a certain data rate. And bandwidth is expensive. Okay, so before we go to OFDM, let's talk about FDM, right? So suppose we have some bandwidth. Now look at the picture on the right here. Uh, let's say we have from 60 kilohertz to 120 kilohertz, and we could subdivide that bandwidth into three different channels, right? We have 60 to 80 kilohertz, 80 to 100, 100 to 120. And we can, you know, that, that's effectively dividing the frequency, hence frequency division. And we can send symbols on each of these channels independently. All right, one does not depend on the other. So, you know, ordinarily we would have just had a single bandwidth from 60 to 100 kilo, 120 kilohertz, and that'll give us bandwidth of 100, uh, sorry, 60 kilohertz. And we'd be able to send some amount of data per second, say 60 kilosamples per second over this 60 kilohertz bandwidth. Um, but because we divided it into three sections, now we're basically sending three uh, different channels of data, each one at a third of the data rate, but we're still effectively sending the same amount of data. All right, so the question is, what's the point of this? And well, think about it this way. You know, say your, your channel looks like this. Uh, that's, that's a bad channel. Let me redo that. Oops. So say, say, I don't know looks like that, right? And so, so uh, originally we would have just sent a single little bandwidth of information here that'll cover this entire area. However, we have this huge dip in the middle and that means you're gonna have a lot of distortion in that single channel. Now what we can do instead is split this into three smaller channels. So I'll create one here, one here, and one here. And so over this smaller bandwidth channel, let's say we can approximate this as roughly flat. So there's very little distortion in this guy. Same for this guy, there is a, there's attenuation, but it's still roughly flat. And then this one's screwed, can't do much about that. So uh, what we've done is we've taken a large bandwidth that had no hope of effectively communicating because of this distortion due to the large dip in this uh, frequency response. Uh, we've turned it into three different channels, 
The first two can maybe communicate well. The last one's a little iffy, but at least we got two out of three, right? Is that everyone following there? So that, that, that is effectively the advantage of doing this. Um, you know, in, in a more realistic scenario, you might have more than three, and in doing so, you'd be able to shrink the bandwidth of each channel to make it even smaller. And you'll get closer and closer to that narrow band assumption I mentioned at, uh, at the beginning, where the channel bandwidth, or the, you know, the modulation bandwidth is much smaller than the coherence bandwidth of the channel for, for these individual um, you know, channel one, two, and three, or up to n. Um, quick question about how we're still sending the same amount of data though. Like if, if I if I convolve my um, uh, in input signal with my channel response, irrespective of whether it's one train across a bandwidth of 60 kilohertz or three pulses of 20 kilohertz a pop, isn't the, con like the loss in the middle rectangle like the same area being lost? So the difference, all right, well, let me, let me redraw this figure since it's getting pretty messy. The key difference is that um, here, sorry. Right, so in this case, uh, let, 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 let me add some numbers here to make this more clear, right? This is say 60 to 120 kilohertz. So this guy has a bandwidth of 60 kilohertz, right? And that means we're effectively sending 60 kilosamples, or, uh, I should say symbols, kilosymbols uh, per second, right? Um, now the problem is that you have this huge dip in the middle, which means at the receiver, we're not gonna be able to you know, uh, uh, effectively uh, detect those symbols, right? Meaning that this is kind of infeasible. We can't actually do this. And you know, in reality, you can't do it um, there's some techniques, you know, there's channel estimation techniques, channel equalization, but if you didn't do those, uh, you'd have no way of doing this. And uh, if you recall a few lectures ago, we talked about intersymbol interference. This is kind of the same thing, except in the frequency domain, right? The, uh, this dip is gonna cause some smearing out of your nice perfect square uh, pulses or you know, whatever type of pulse you're sending. And you might, you know, one symbol might start blending into another and you'll have a hard time distinguishing between them. Now, the advantage of this frequency division approach is we split this into three channels. And if you assume that these, these three channels are squished right next to each other such that you know, there's no bandwidth we're missing out on, right? What I'm saying is that because, so now each of these channels is 20 kilohertz bandwidth, right? So we're sending 20 kilosymbols, uh, 20 kilosymbols per second in each of these three uh, channels, right? So a total of still 60 kilosymbols per second. So same data rate. However, you know, the uh, you're going to experience much less intersymbol interference, much less distortion of your signal because the the frequency response of the entire channel is now more constant within the bandwidth of each of these individual channels, and so that that'll make it a lot easier to detect and receive the symbols. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Ah, okay. That, that makes sense. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I have another little numerical example here. It's saying the exact same thing. So now the problem is, of course, is that, oh, you can have a slide for it. The problem <laughs> is that we can't stick these uh, bandwidths right next to each other. And the reason is that in order to have these perfectly square looking, uh, uh, you know, individual channels, you need to have an infinite time domain response, right? Remember the inverse Fourier transform of a square pulse is a sync function, which has an infinite duration in time. So you can't do that. So what ne inevitably ends up happening is that, you know, your, your channels will start looking a little more round and they'll start smearing into the adjacent channels. This is in frequency, right? And that means that adjacent channels will start affecting each other. And you'll basically have a similar problem to the channel fading where, uh, you know, you'll, you'll have a hard time detecting individual symbols. So that's no good either. So effectively what we need to do is we need to increase the space between adjacent channels uh, to set, you know, add some separation between them so they don't interfere with each other. And that means that we're using more bandwidth than we would have had, would have used otherwise, meaning that we're making a compromise between the extra bandwidth and decreasing the adjacent channel interference. And remember that bandwidth is very expensive. We don't want to use extra bandwidth. The other thing is that in order to actually to do the receiver part of this, we need to filter each channel apart from, uh, sorry, we need to filter each channel out, right? So we have to have a bandpass filter around each of these the center frequencies. And that could become a big problem, right? Because if these channels start getting really close to each other, you need very sharp bandpass filters and those become hard to make. So here's where OFDM finally comes into the picture. Right, we've been waiting about 40 minutes. So let's talk about that. So OFDM, it's a type of frequency division multiplexing. But instead of uh, you know, trying to create enough distance between each of the adjacent channels, here what we're doing is we're allowing the channels to overlap, but overlap in a very particular way. Um, I'll introduce the term here, subcarriers. So what a subcarrier is, uh, is basically the carrier frequency of each of those individual channels. So like if you have N channels, you'll have N subcarriers, each at a, a certain frequency. Okay, so the question is, how do we space these subcarriers? And I'll introduce some more notation here, right? We have N subcarriers and they're gonna be spaced delta F apart. And you know the, the key is choosing this delta F, right? If we don't choose that right, then we'll still have the problem where the channels interfere with each other. Um, and then each of these subcarriers will be modulated and the modulation will have a simple period T. So nothing too fancy yet. Um, now, what I'm gonna say, is that this delta F is equal to one over T. And let's see why that's important. So what that does is that means that the carrier, the subcarrier frequencies will now be orthogonal to each other. And that's a very important point. So to prove that uh, we can, you know, work out the, the actual integral, right? So if you take, one of the subcarriers, which is this, and it has some modulation, right? So if we have IQ modulation, remember that's the same thing as amplitude and phase modulation. So I'm saying this subcarrier is modulated with some amplitude AI. It has some phase modulation phi I, and its frequency is FI. And I'm gonna multiply that to another subcarrier, 
So same thing, you have AJ, pi j, and two pi fjt. And remember that when we multiply two cosines, we get a sum and difference frequency, right? So the, the two frequencies we're gonna get is, sorry, not a four. We are going to get a two pi fi plus fj. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna ignore the phases for now and we'll see why they don't matter. And we'll also get a two pi fi minus fj. Now remember that I, one of the stipulations I made is that delta f is equal to one over t. Uh, one over t. So fi minus fj, because the frequencies are spaced by multiples of this one over t, this is going to be equal to two pi times n over t, where n is just some integer, one, two, three, so on. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Um, and right, so now if take a look at this term. Fi plus Fj is basically some very high frequency component, right? Um, you know, the, the usual assumption we make is that the carrier frequencies are much, much larger than the symbol rate which is usually a very good assumption, right? So if that's the case, that means that Fi plus Fj is even larger than the symbol, uh, frequent, uh, symbol rate, uh, equivalently much, much uh, smaller than T, um, or sorry, uh, much, much larger than one over T. And so if you look at that integral, uh, of just the first, this double frequency term, or the, the sum frequency, you have the integral from zero to t of some cosine of this frequency, plus some phase, but ignore the phase for now. And if you look at this, you know, a cosine is some oscillating function. And I'll draw out a few periods here for, to illustrate my point, right? So it doesn't just go to zero there, but you, know, you get the point here. Um, so here's that cosine. And let's say T is this small sliver, sorry, not the small sliver, it's a big sliver, right? Because T is much larger than the, the, the period of this cosine. So let's say T is from here to here. So this point here is T. And if we integrate over this entire thing, we're basically gonna get zero, right? But you know, as T goes to infinity, the integral of a cosine goes to zero because it's oscillating above one, below one. So effectively this term just disappears and we're left with the integral of cosine two pi n over t plus a few phase terms. And this integral also goes to zero, right? Because the period of this is going to be two pi divided by two pi over t, which is just uh, times n, right? So it's just gonna be n times t, that's the period. And, uh, um, and the integral, sorry, uh, t over n, not n times t. And the integral from zero to t of that is just zero, right? We're integrating over uh, uh, a full period or n full periods of this term. So that's also gonna go to zero, which means this entire integral goes to zero and that proved what I set out to prove, which was that these two terms are orthogonal to each other. So any questions about that? Hopefully that made sense. Okay. 
And so what that means is that remember when we try to demodulate, um, you know, an amplitude and phase modulated cosine, all we're doing is multiplying it by a cosine of the same frequency and low pass filtering it. And a low pass filter is kind of equivalent to an integral, right? It's kind of like an average in a sense. Um, and that average in a sense, that integral, is going to be zero if we're multiplying it by one of the other subcarriers, and only going to give you the right, only going to give you a non-zero quantity if you're multiplying it by the correct subcarrier. So we, we can effectively identify each of these individual uh, channels, even though they're overlapping, by just multiplying by the right cosine and integrating or low pass filtering. So that, that makes sense to everyone. And if, if you look at it in the frequency domain, um, each of these little sync looking things is like a channel or a, a subcarrier. And you can kind of see that uh, the each individual subcarrier goes to zero. These sync functions go to zero while the other ones reach a maximum. And that's kind of like a visualization of the orthogonality. Similar to the uh, ISI stuff we talked about, the raised cosine windowing and so on. Okay. So this is kind of what I talked about just now. How do we modulate and demodulate? But let's go into more detail. So if we have a we, we have some n uh, subcarriers, right? So I'm saying the ith one, I'm going to call it ui of t, is basically ai times cosine of 2 pi fi t plus some phase, theta i. And I realize I've been swapping between phi and theta, but they're the same thing here. Um, and then we can rewrite this in terms of a complex exponential. That's nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, we just have ai times e to the j theta i times e to the j2 pi fi t, right? And we take the real part to get the cosine. Now, if I call this part, I'm gonna call that xi. So that, that's kind of like the complex um, baseband representation of the modulation. So I'm gonna call that xi is a, ai e to the j theta i. And then I can rewrite ui in this form. And this is what we saw earlier, just with you know ordinary digital modulation. It's the same exact thing. So what I'm saying is that you can modulate each of these subcarriers any way you want, um, as long as you have this particular channel spacing, everything's good. So you know, XI could be a VPSK modulation, it could be QAM, uh, QPSK, and so on. Now, uh, how do we get the total signal we're transmitting? Well, we just add up all the subcarriers. So, you know, here's I'm doing the summation, zero to n minus one of all the subcarriers. Uh, and then I'm dividing by a square root of n. That's just a normalization. So what, what that's saying is that if you take the, uh, you know, you square this to get the power or the energy. And so you'll just have a one over n times the summation, the summation will give you n terms. So basically that's just normalizing everything to one. So that's nothing unusual. Um, okay, and then demodulation, we, like I said, you just multiply by the correct subcarrier for each of the different subcarriers. Um, if you're doing IQ modulation, you just do cosine and sine, you low pass filter, you get the I and Q channels and everything's good. But notice, I write up here inefficient because there's a better way to do this. And this is kind of unique to or OFDM, um, which is the next slide, the efficient method, which is the way it's always done. And there, there's some math here, but let me walk through it. And I think it'll be kind of nifty if you've never seen this before. So at the top here, I'm rewriting what we already know our transmitted signal x of t is just the summation of the subcarriers ui. 
times the some normalization, right? And then I'm writing out the UI, so that's just the real part of XI times the carrier frequency or the subcarrier frequency. Um, and I can separate out this FI term and it's going to be some F, which is uh, the basically the lowest subcarrier frequency. And then there's going to be this I times delta F term. So if you multiply these two, you just have an F plus I delta F, right? And that just gets you to the right subcarrier frequency. So all I did is just separate those two terms, nothing special there. But note that I can now take this term out of the summation because it doesn't depend on I. Right. So on the next line here, I've taken that term out of the summation and everything else is as it should be, unless I made any mistakes. I don't think I made any mistakes. Um, so now I'm going to pull out this quantity and take a look at it under a microscope. Let's see what we can do with it. I'm going to call this term x prime of t. Um, so this x prime of t is just you know, a summation of the xi times, uh, oops, I forgot a j there, just times a uh, complex exponential whose frequency depends on the subcarrier frequency, you know, the i delta f. All right, so all of this is digital modulation. We tend to work in uh, on a digital system, right? Like a microcontroller, or FPGA or something. And so all of these signals should really be sampled when you think of them on a digital device, right? So what, we're, what we'll do is we'll sample this X prime of T at a rate of N over T. So N is the number of subcarriers, T is the symbol period. So the, the effective uh, sample period is gonna be T over N, right? So you're, you're going to have N samples, big N samples per symbol period. That makes sense to everyone? Okay. Um, so down here, I'm writing that out. So I'm gonna have X prime of K T N over N. K is just, you know, the sample index. And I just plug that in to X prime of T. And you get this thing here. And here's where things get interesting. So remember that Delta F is equal to one over T, right? That was one of the stipulations we made. So this Delta F can cancel with this T. And we're just left with a two pi times I times K over N. And if you remember anything from 113, this is the formula for the inverse discrete Fourier transform. Okay, that's interesting. So what does that mean? That means that the sampled X prime is equal to the IDFT of these big XIs. And remember that the XIs are just the, the modulations for each of the subcarriers. So, you know, let's say subcarrier one is modulated with BPSK. So X1 might be one or minus one. Um, let's say X2 is four qualm. So X2 might be, uh, you know, one J minus one or minus J or something like that. Uh, any questions there? Okay. So what does this mean? This means that we could do, um, there should be a parenthesis there. This means that we can do uh, modulation just by doing the IDFT of these XIs and then multiplying them to the, just the, the lowest subcarrier frequency. And then of course, take the real part to get the cosine. And that could be sent directly to the DAC uh, as the output of your digital domain, right? No, notice that this 
this uh, carrier frequency is also sampled. Um, so everything here is in a sample domain, so a discrete domain. Okay. And then on the receiver side, we're, rec we're basically receiving this signal here. Um, all we need to do is first get rid of this high frequency component. That's just multiplying by this exponential, right? Doing a low pass filter and everything's good. And then we just do the, the discrete Fourier transform of this X prime and that'll get us back the XIs, right? So modulation and demodulation, you don't have to do each subcarrier independent, uh, you know, uh, you don't have to individually demodulate and modulate each subcarrier. You can do it all at the same time with IDFT or uh, DFT. And remember that the DFT can be really efficiently implemented using the FFT. Um, so this is in fact very, a very efficient uh, method of doing this modulation, this OFD modulation, much better than the previous method. All right, so far so good. I have a question. Yes. Um, so I think everything hinges on it being sampled at the receiver um, at the rate n over t, which is symbols per something period. Um, how, how does the receiver know this rate? Is it just like a constant? Well, for, for, from the get-go, um, the receiver knows how many subcarriers there are, right? Because there's a standard protocol that both the transmitter and receiver are following, right? The, the same way that the receiver needs to know which modulations the transmitter is using. Um, and so the receiver is gonna know how long a symbol period is, it's also going to know how many subcarriers there are. And that you know uniquely determines this T over N. Right. Now, of course, there's going to be timing errors and frequency offsets, and those will cause a big mess. So you have to get that right too. But that's the same for any modulation, really. Um, I, I will say though that OFDN tends to be more sensitive to you know timing and frequency offsets than other modulations, but there are numerous advantages that we'll talk about as well. All right. Okay. So speaking of advantages, um, let's see what we what we've accomplished with this OFDM stuff. So the first thing is by choosing n large, right, the number of subcarriers, we're able to shrink down the bandwidths of the individual subcarriers and make the uh, overall channel frequency response effectively constant over those small bandwidths. And you know, thinking about this in terms of the time domain, what we're doing is that we're having a, a, a you know, n subcarriers transmitting at very low data rates, but the fact that we have n of them means we're multiplying the data rate of a single subcarrier by n, and that'll get us back or at least close to the data rate we would have gotten by just having a single uh, subcarrier or you know a single carrier rather. So that's kind of solved that problem. Um, we've also solved the excess spectrum usage of just plain old frequency division multiplexing by you know, having those subcarriers overlap, their bandwidths overlap, but the fact that um, they're orthogonal means that overlapping is not a problem. Um, we also don't need those complex subcarrier filters uh, that you need for ordinary frequency division multiplexing. Um, and that's because we can do, uh, you know, this because these uh, like subcarriers are orthogonal to each other. Um, and then we know how to efficiently modulate and demodulate using the FFT. And next, or very shortly, we'll talk about 
uh, the other advantage of OFDM, which is uh, how it's able to adapt to adverse channel conditions. So we'll see that. But first, we have to talk about the disadvantages. Here are listed two, but there, there are a few more. Um, one of the big ones, though, is that OFDM tends to have much higher peak to average power ratio compared to ordinary modulation. So uh, remember with BPSK, for example, the amplitude of the signal is basically constant, right? Um, you know, it's just a sine wave, occasionally reverses phase. So it goes, flips 180 degrees, you know, and so on. So that's BPSK. But all in all, the amplitude is constant. And that means that this, uh, number called the peak to average power ratio, the PAPR, is fairly small. And the way that's defined is, you know, this has a peak value, which is the amplitude of this, this sinusoidal wave. And it also has uh, an average value, or, you know, an RMS value, right? If you're thinking the, you know, remember back to circuits, your AC signals have RMS values. Um, so, what that's doing is a measure of average power, right? RMS is kind of like average power. And then the peak is just the, the peak squared. So the PAPR is the average of peak, the peak squared to the average power. Um, and so why is this important? Well, you know, any useful communication system or transmitter rather is going to have an amplifier that power is some antenna, right? And in, in the case of a cell phone that might be outputting say watts of power, in the case of a cellular base station that might be kilowatts of power. And so this is the power amplifier, right? Outputs a lot of power. And the efficiency of this power amplifier is very important. You know, in the case of a cell phone, it's, it's important because you want to minimize battery usage. In the case of a cellular base station, you want to minimize power consumption, but you uh, are also limited by, you know, thermally, right? If you dissipate too much power as heat, then uh, your transmitter is just going to burn up, or you have to spend excess amount of money on heat sinks or cooling for that power amplifier. And when you're talking kilowatts, that's a big deal, right? It's, if you're transmitting at a kilowatt and you have a 1% efficiency, that means you know, you're, you're burning like 100 watts, or sorry, not 100, you're burning 10 watts in heat, and that's a lot of power to dissipate. Um, you know, at, at RF frequencies and microwave frequencies, you're typically talking like closer to 60 or 70% efficiency at best. Um, so that, that, that's even worse, right? Now, now you're talking, you're dissipating 30, 40 watts in that kilowatt transmitter. Um, so clearly it's a big problem. Now back to OFDM, uh, on the bottom here, I plotted a typical looking OFDM waveform. This is, this is actually much nicer than it actually looks. And you can see it looks pretty horrible. Um, so OFDM waveforms, this is the time domain. They tend to look pretty noise-like. So you have big spikes, um, but the average power is it's much lower than those big spikes. And so that means that OFDM has a large peak to average ratio. And um, when it comes to power amplifiers, that tends to mean less efficiency, right? Power amplifiers don't work well with high PAPR signals. Um, and another way of looking at this is right, let's say you have just a, a ordinary amplifier. So this might be P in, the power input, and this might be P out, the power output. So for low powers, um, this P in over, a P out over P in is fairly linear, right? You, you give it five watts, it'll output, say, I don't know, 10 watts. You give it one watt and it'll output two watts. So there's a ratio of two there. Um, I should do this in terms of dB, right? You don't want you don't want linearity in uh, in, in watts. So let me rephrase that. 
say you input zero dBm, it'll output 10 dBm. And say you, out, you input 10 dBm, it'll output 20 dBm. So there's a linear uh, relationship from input to output. Uh, but at some point, the output's gonna start compressing, right? What that means is you start feeding in more and more power, but the output will start leveling off. And now the problem with that is that you're, you're sending in this OFDM waveform and you really wanna operate in this linear region, right? And uh, what that means is that you're kind of leaving this compression region alone. You don't wanna operate there because otherwise you're distorting this OFDM signal. Um, however, with power amplifiers, you actually get the best efficiency when you're operating in this compression region. And so what that means is that because you know, the, the effective dynamic range of this OFDM signal is so large, uh, most of the time you're operating, you know, down this way and very little amount of time are you operating close to this high efficiency region. So hopefully that gives some insight why having a lower PAPR is better for efficiency, but you can't do much about it with OFDM. It just happens to be high. Now, the other reason Another disadvantage for OFDM is that it tends to be more sensitive to timing and frequency errors. Uh, part of the reason is uh, due to the spectral leakage of the DFT, right? Because if you don't have things lined up well, then uh, you, uh, you'll kind of like start leaking uh, signal into different bins of that DFT. So if, uh, you need to be lined up just right with the uh, actual signal. Um, to be honest, I don't understand this point as well as the other points. So I don't have much to say about it, but hopefully that gives some insight. <laughs> um, the other thing I'll mention, if you notice here, in this figure, there's something called a guard interval. And so what a guard interval is, you might hear the term cyclic prefix. Um, what that's doing is adding a little space between two adjacent symbols. Um, so, you know, we talked about intersymbol interference before. OFDM does indeed mitigate intersymbol interference, but it's not gone completely. So, what's done is a, you know, a little space is added between adjacent symbols where a certain, um, uh, certain values are added just to act like a buffer. Uh, so if in the case of this symbol starting to leak into the other symbol, first it leaks into this guard interval, but we throw that away because it doesn't contain any useful information. So we're left with a pristine uh, actual symbol. Um, there's more to these guard intervals, but it goes a little beyond the scope of this. Uh, yes, there's a question. Yeah, I had a question. I don't know, maybe kind of a dumb one, but uh, the guard intervals in time to ensure that we have sharper um, channel or subcarrier cutoffs in. So it's it's not frequency? due. The the guard interval it just acts as a space between two adjacent symbols. So if we got rid of this guard interval, and we immediately followed this symbol with this symbol with no space in between, there's a possibility of some intersymbol interference, which is to say that uh, this M minus one symbols will kind of smear into the next one. And that'll, uh, you know, that'll cause intersymbol interference and give us trouble when we try to demodulate and decipher this. Does that answer the question? Yeah. I also had a question. Yes. Uh, so this pretty much exact question popped up on our 113 midterm. And the correct answer was that it allows us to do a uh, circular convolution, apparently. Yes. Uh, my question was, for circular convolution, uh, 
pretty much how would this help accomplish that? So uh, when, when you say circular convolution, the question is, what are you convolving with? So this, so this uh, signal here, I call that X of T. This is being convolved at the, once it gets to the, to the receiver, it's being convolved with the impulse response of the channel, right? That we talked about earlier, right? You know, we have multi-paths, so you have all those deltas that are shifted in time. But if we think about this in the discrete domain, you know, you might have say X of K or something. And this will be, you can write it as a circular convolution of C of K. And remember that K has those deltas. If we take the discrete form, you're kind of getting an FIR filter, a finite impulse response filter, right? So you'll have, you know, delta one, and delta two, and maybe the phase will flip delta three. At some point, they'll go down to zero. So this will be C of K. So, this impulse response is basically four, uh, has a length of four, right? There's no other information here. So if we make this yard interval four samples long, that enables a, and, and the other thing, you know, the important point here is that these four, these four samples, are the exact same as these four samples. So basically we take the end of the symbol and chop off the last four symbols, four samples and move it to the beginning. And that allows circular convolution to occur in the first place, right? Does that make sense? Yep. I, I think what I was missing was that it's an identical copy. Yes, that's the important point. Um, and the reason why that's a nice thing to have is if you think about this in the frequency domain, or I guess like the, the DFT domain, um, instead of having this circular convolution, let me write it over here, we have X of, I don't know, give me a, a letter, let's say, Let's call it W. Let's say that's the frequency domain uh, variable. So we have X of W times C of W. Right, because convolution turns into multiplication like it always does. And that means we receive this. And if we know X, or if we know what X should be, let's say we, we know X. Well, um, how should I phrase this? Uh, here, what, what, we, what we receive is, let's call it Y, right? So we receive Y, we know what X is, let's assume we know what X is, and we want to find out what the channel is doing to our signal. Well, we know y, we know x, so we could just do y over x is equal to c, right? C of w. So what this allows us to do is basically compute the frequency response of the channel using these guard inter well, using the fact that these guard intervals are here, which allows a circular convolution, which allows us to do the Fourier transform in the first place. Um, and by knowing the frequency response of the channel, now we can start to correct for any channel non-idealities because we know exactly how it's affecting our signal. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, I mentioned this right here, channel equalization. Um, so 
what, what this is saying here is we know each subcarrier is a narrow band signal, right? The modulation is slow enough such that the bandwidth is small. And so we're making the approximation that the channel, the, the channel effect on each subcarrier is basically multiplying it by a constant, a complex constant, some attenuation factor, right? It'll have some phase shift, that'll have some attenuation. But that phase shift and attenuation won't vary over the bandwidth of the subcarrier. And all right here, if this transmitter sends a known simple sequence, that's that X of, of W that I talked about earlier, then we can use that to estimate the attenuation of each subcarrier by performing this thing right here, right? And you know, I write this here, we divide the received symbols by the complex attenuation constants um, once we know them, and then we can undo any effects that the channel has. So basically what the transmitter can do is it can send this known symbol sequence. We can do the channel estimation, and then the, the transmitter will start sending the actual data it wants to send. And by knowing the, these, the, knowing the channel effects by doing this channel estimation, then we can perform channel equalization um, and correct for those effects. So, you know, before we talked about phase shift estimation and all of that, um, this is kind of how you would do it in OFDM. Okay. And then up here, I talked about OFDMA. This is the how you use OFDM for multiple axis. So remember, we talked about multiple axis with uh, uh, frequency division multiple axis FDMA. Well, this is pretty similar. The idea is that we as assign certain subcarriers to different users and have them only listen to those subcarriers. You know, they're receiving all of the subcarriers, but they only need to listen to the one they're assigned to. So that's just a way of uh, being able to communicate with multiple people at the same time using the same trend, uh, communication system. Okay. And you know, I, think, I think this is kind of cool. Um, so adaptive subcarrier selection and modulation. So he, here I plotted, remember way back a few slides ago, um, I plotted an example of a channel frequency response. Um, and so, you know, you have your channel fading down here where you get some excessive attenuation and then everything's nice and happy up here. But say we're using OFDM and we have a bunch of subcarriers, right? So maybe we have a subcarrier here or okay, let me, Make that smaller. So say we say we have a subcarrier here. We have a subcarrier here. Subcarrier here. You know, we have a subcarrier here, and so on. Right. And maybe we have some here as well. So who knows how many we actually have? But we have some number of subcarriers in this OFDM system. And remember that these are narrow band individual channels, right? So we can basically consider the frequency response of the channel constant over these individual subcarriers. Um, but you can see that certain subcarriers, you know, let's say if I take this one right here, it'll experience way more attenuation due to the channel than this one over here, right? And so that means that if I call this subcarrier one, and this is subcarrier two, subcarrier one will have way lower SNR, signal to noise ratio, than subcarrier two. And remember that in order to, I mentioned at the beginning, in order to have a high modulation order, right, in order to pack as many bits as possible into an individual symbol, 
we need to have an ISNR. Otherwise, we encounter a lot of bit error rate, a lot of bit errors. So, you know, lower SNR means a uh, higher chance of a bit error. So, using OFDM, we, we're allowed a little more freedom. So, what we can do is, you know, for example, we could choose not to transmit on subcarrier one and instead use the power we, we would have spent on subcarrier one and use it on subcarrier two. So, we, we effectively double the SNR, or we double the amount of power going to subcarrier two, you know, increase the SNR by 3 dB or something. And that'll allow us to say increase the, or decrease the, the bit error rate of subcarrier two by just not transmitting on subcarrier one. Question, yes. Sorry, so if we're uh, transmitting on all these subcarriers in, bar okay, so sorry, two questions. First, to make sure that I'm uh, following this right, what we're basically doing is saying that the channel has a certain frequency response, and by changing the properties of the different frequencies that we put into the channel, we can maximize how much information we're packing into that frequency range. Is that the is that fair to say S say that again <laughs> um so if, if i'm following right like like specifically with that second and third point or the, the general idea is that because the channel has a certain frequency response and the frequency profile as well by changing um what we put on different frequencies we can maximize how much information we're sending across the channel right yeah so my my question with that though is given that the receiver is receiving all of these in parallel doesn't the different bit rates for because the symbol rate is same irrespective of what modulation uh, scheme we use right mm. so if we have the same symbol rate but some symbols that have fewer bits per symbol doesn't the receiver receiving different bits per second, like, doesn't that fuck with the receiver? Um, no, it doesn't. So uh, remember what, so after doing the FFT on the receiver, you're getting back those XIs, right? Yeah. And each of those XIs corresponds to each of the subcarriers. And the, uh, you, you can imagine it like having N different constellation diagrams and they're each independent. And each of the XIs gets sent to one of the, one, the ith constellation diagram, right? Okay. So, so all the receiver needs to know is which subcarrier, uh, well, what, what type of modulation each subcarrier has on it. So, you know, subcarrier one might have BPSK, subcarrier two might have four QAM. The receiver just needs to know which is which, and it could use the XIs to determine which symbol is being actually sent. Okay. Okay. But is it, isn't the idea that the receiver receiving all XIs all the time? Yes. Well, so every, so if I draw it out like this, so if this is time here, um, you're going to receive one packet, basically one symbol of information. This is T. And you know, after another T, you'll receive another symbol. Um, but this entire symbol has N subcarriers, right? So this is really um, this is x0, x1, all the way to xn. And then for this symbol, you receive another uh, set of these x's, but they'll be different, right? To correspond to a different symbol. Oh, OK. OK. This should be capital N. <laughs> 
I see. And so the encoding for each XI can be different, but as long as the receiver knows which encoding was used for each XI, it can decode them, put them back together, and basically reconstruct the symbol between zero and capital T. Right, exactly. Got it. Right, and because you have N symbols, um, and you, you know, each one might correspond to some number of bits. Uh, you'll have a, a full number of bits that you also have to put in order. But again, that, that's really um, a matter of protocol, not really you know, inherent design. It's really up to how you want to structure that. Right, and, and that's what the third point is then getting at, that each XI can basically have a different number of bits depending on how much energy per bit we can dedicate, which is set by the SNR for that frequency. Exactly. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, that, that, that okay, thanks. That, yep. that makes a lot of sense. Right, so, so to further emphasize that point, if subcarrier one, if, if we know it's going to have a low SNR because it's in this channel fade, then we could choose to send say BPSK on it because BPSK is a lot more robust than the other higher order modulations. And say on subcarrier two, we, we might send say 64 QAM or something um, because we know it's going to have a high SNR. And so it's going to have uh, less bit error rate essentially. Um, and so th that'll allow us to maximize um, or basically maximize data write while minimizing bit error rate for this given bandwidth we have. Um, so someone might ask, how does the transmitter know what the channel is if we're doing the channel estimation on the receiver? And the simple answer to that is that the receiver just tells the transmitter, right? Because, you know, if there's bi-directional communication, you could just send data back and forth. It's not, not too big of a deal. Um, the other thing that I want to mention, I don't have a slide on this though, is one of the key assumptions we made here is that, you know, this is the frequency response of the channel but the channel is not changing over time. So we would assume that the channel is linear and time invariant. And that a time invariant part is a very big assumption. The linear one, not so much, right? Because air is pretty linear, um, but time invariance is not always a good assumption. So, you know, for example, say you're in a car, you have your cell phone out and, you know, you're passing by buildings. But remember that the whole reason why we have these, this channel fading is because of those re multi-path reflections. So if you're moving along, then at, at certain points, uh, you know, things will add constructively. At certain points in your car ride, things will add destructively. So what's going to happen in effect is that this frequency response is gonna change over time. And well, so one thing we could do is on the receiver, we just continuously have to re-perform the channel estimation um, and you know do those corrections. And that's not a, a problem only with OFDM, it would be a problem with every single type of modulation out there. Um, but uh, we can characterize how fast the channel is changing by what's called the uh, Doppler spread. So you can basically define a time, what we'll say I call it TD. Um, and kind of similar to the multipath spread, what I could say is that as long as the symbol period is much smaller, or sorry, not much smaller, other way around. As long as the symbol period is much bigger than this Doppler spread or Doppler time, then I can make the assumption that the channel is roughly constant um, during a single symbol. 
If it's not, then you clearly have problems. But you can see one of the clear advantages. Um, sorry, I got this backwards. <laughs> uh, as long as the symbol period is much smaller than this time, then the channel is effectively constant over the symbol period duration, right? Um, now, remember with OFDM, what we're doing is we're trying to increase this, um, the symbol period, right? By increasing the symbol period, we're making the bandwidth smaller and that solves the multipathing problem. So this is kind of running contrary to that goal, right? If we make the symbol period too long, then the channel is gonna be changing during a single symbol period. And that's not a good thing. So when you're designing a communication system, among a bunch of other uh, issues, you kind of have two bounding limits on your symbol period. You have the, you know, this Doppler spread, right? So the symbol period can't be too long. It also can't be too short because of the multipathing problem. So this kind of gives you constraints on choosing the symbol period. And that in turn gives you constraints on choosing how many subcarries you have. And you know the bandwidth and all of those things. So you have to take all this to in, in, into account. Um, you know, in, in terms of determining these numbers, you know, this one and this one, um, there are models out there, and you know, there's a bunch of papers of people trying to estimate these numbers for certain environments. So you know, you might have, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, no signal fires. Sorry. Um, so you might have, what was I saying? All right, so like in, in an urban environment with a bunch of buildings, you might have a certain um, uh, multi-pathing spread, uh, multi-path spread. And if you're out in an open field, you know, clearly this number will be much smaller because there's not many reflections. And then on the other side, say you're moving in a car, this number will be smaller, this TD. If you're just standing still, and nothing else is moving, then this number will become much larger. Um, so, you know, if ever in a car and you're moving really fast, you might notice your data rate start going down. And there's reasons for that. <laughs> so anyway, that, that's kind of all I have for today, unless anybody has any questions. Otherwise, we can call it a day. Okay.